death is a cup from which every living thing must drink. Following the deadly Hamas attack in October, Israeli forces have pushed south and up to 300,000 reservists have been called up. The Israeli military has now set its sights on the Gaza Strip. However, ominous signs are growing on its northern border with Lebanon. Hezbollah has vowed to stand by Hamas and has threatened to open a second and third front to Israel's north. Already, Israel and Hezbollah have traded missiles and a handful of troops on both sides have been killed. Civilians in the vicinity are getting ready for wider hostilities. In South Lebanon, the roads heading north are congested with traffic jams. People are fleeing, making way for a gruesome conflict that might just set the entire Middle East on fire. Hezbollah has roughly 130,000 rockets and missiles and it could use that firepower to overwhelm Israel's air defenses and destroy Israeli bases and critical infrastructure, including presumed nuclear weapons facilities in northern Israel. So yeah, as bad as things seem in Gaza, this is the Middle East where things can always go from bad to worse. The Israeli strikes on Gaza, Syria and the West Bank are being widely covered in the media with more than 200 sources reporting on the threat of these strikes igniting other fronts. These reports are being shared on social media around the world, leading to yet another type of conflict, an information war. On this channel, we prioritize diligent research rather than speed. We check multiple credible sources, and we try to capture nuance and complexity by seeking out claims from all sides. All of this takes time, but one of the best tools we have to make this more accessible is ground news. They collect thousands of sources from around the world and across the political spectrum in one place. Right now, they have a detailed timeline of events showing how the media has covered the conflict, starting with the attack on October 7th. But on this issue, it's not just about left and right. There are national interests at stake. For example, I can see that 12% of sources covering the recent strikes were government affiliated. If I look at specific headlines, I can see that a source associated with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps suggests that Israeli strikes are motivated by the United States. This is how governments attempt to win the information war. A Ground News Unlimited Access membership is about $5 a month if you use my link ground.news Caspian to get 30% off. You can also subscribe to their pro plan for as little as $1 a month. I find it more valuable now than ever in this conflict involving ancient rivalries where outside powers are competing for their own interests. Because if you accept any one narrative as the full story, you're going to miss the bigger picture. Israel is getting ready to flex its muscles and show its teeth. This video shows a massive amount of Mk-84 general purpose bombs that will be put onto Israeli fighter jets and likely dropped over Gaza. Each of these bombs weighs about 900 kilograms and each is capable of creating a crater that is 15 meters wide and 10 meters deep. These bombs are equipped with JDAM guidance which allows them to be guided toward relocatable targets from both bombers and fighter jets. Upon impact, the bombs can penetrate up to 38 centimeters of metal and up to 3 meters of concrete. The amount of bombs in the video is enough to level Gaza City. As if pounding neighborhoods in Gaza is not enough, the Israeli military is also setting the stage to launch a full-scale ground invasion into the northern half of the Gaza Strip. This is where things could go horribly wrong. Hamas is believed to have around 40,000 fully trained soldiers. And since it's battling on its own turf, it will have the defender's advantage. The Gaza Strip is riddled with underground tunnels, ambush sites and concealed outposts equipped with ATGMs to destroy incoming Israeli tanks and vehicles. Gaza is also considered one of the most 
densely packed urban areas in the world. So, house-to-house -house fighting in Gaza could get real ugly, real fast. To give color to the military setting, Israel has fought Hamas four times before in 2006, 2008, 2012, and as recently as 2021. Each conflict, however, ended indecisively. Hamas took a beating, but it retained complete control over Gaza. All the same, the Israelis say, this time will be different, and it certainly looks that way. Up to 300,000 reservists have been called up, and government officials have vowed to destroy Hamas once and for all. Israel is now in the offing to deploy its military on a scale not seen before. However, as grim as these developments are, Hamas is not the main player. Plenty of vultures are circling the area, looking for easy pickings and new opportunities. About 200 kilometers to the north is Lebanon, which hosts Hezbollah. Backed by Iran in funding, planning and expertise, Hezbollah is one of the world's deadliest non-state actors certainly the most heavily armed one. Since the 1990s, it has grown from a band of ragtag guerrilla rebels into a powerful fighting force numbering around 100,000 strong, according to the group's leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Having fought in Syria, Iraq and Yemen, Hezbollah is battle-hardened, and that counts for something. Its troops are trained like an army and equipped like a state. The group is believed to have received financial backing from Iran to the tune of $700 million every year. For a non-state actor, that is a mind-boggling amount of money. Hezbollah is also armed with a large and diverse stockpile of unguided artillery rockets, as well as ballistic, anti-air, anti-tank, and anti-ship missiles. Its capacity for a sustained conflict overshadows that of Hamas many times over. If Israel's ground operation in Gaza does irreparable damage to Hamas, Hezbollah and Iran might be persuaded to intervene and rescue their ally in the Gaza Strip. However, since neither Iran nor Hezbollah has the air or ground forces capable of reaching Gaza, intervention would come mainly in the form of drones, rockets and missiles. In a nutshell, Hezbollah is estimated to have an arsenal of roughly 130,000 rockets and missiles, a number that dates to 2018 and probably has grown since. Either way, that is more firepower than some of the member states of NATO. Speaking from Lebanon on October 13th, Iran's foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, said there was every possibility of a second front if Israel's blockade of Gaza were to continue. If the gloves come off and Hezbollah joins the fight, it would turn the hostilities into a multi-front conflict for Israel. Hamas in the south and Hezbollah in the north. To boot, even Syria would get drawn into the fight since Hezbollah is deeply involved in the Syrian civil conflict. Which means that Hezbollah's involvement would open two fronts simultaneously. One from South Lebanon and one from the Syrian-controlled part of the Golan Heights. Clearly, this would mark a point of no return. On day one, some 130,000 rockets would fly over Israel, resulting in tens of thousands of casualties. Israel would then have no choice but to let loose the full power of its air force. South Lebanon would be decimated in retaliation. The body count would stack up. Civilian casualties would be an afterthought at this point. Israel would then have to move into Beirut to topple the government. By this point, Syria and even Iran would fully take part in the fight as well. Fortunately, things are not at this stage yet, but the situation sits on a knife's edge. Israel has already deployed tens of thousands of troops to the border with Lebanon. It has struck the airports in Damascus and Aleppo. At the same time, Hezbollah has fired missiles into Israel, attempted to infiltrate Israeli towns and launched drone attacks across the border. Things haven't been this tense in years. One miscommunication on either side and the setting could quickly spiral. Still more, the United States has deployed an aircraft carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean. 
The USS Gerald R. Ford is the world's largest aircraft carrier and the largest warship ever constructed. It can field 75 aircraft, including F-35 sea jets. Its naval task is made up of five guided missile ships, four destroyers, and one cruiser. Altogether, it packs one heck of a punch, and its presence in the vicinity is meant to deter Hezbollah and other groups from jumping into the fight. In case the message wasn't clear enough, Washington is now sending a second aircraft carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean, led by the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Using these deployments, America hopes it can prevent the conflict from expanding. However, Iran did not build up Hamas over the years, only to leave it alone to deal with Israel's devastating counter-offensive. In the 11th hour, Hezbollah would likely wait for Israel's invasion of Gaza and then launch a surprise attack at a time of its own choosing. Back in 2006, when hostilities erupted in the Gaza Strip and Israel launched a ground operation, Hezbollah launched an attack of its own, two weeks after the Israeli assault. To everyone's surprise, Hezbollah mounted sophisticated swarming attacks against the Israelis. It also put its rockets and missiles to work, firing almost 4,000 projectiles at Israel over a month. Today, Hezbollah's military capacity is believed to have grown tenfold since the last military encounter 17 years ago. Moreover, while in 2006, Hezbollah's stockpile mostly consisted of inaccurate rockets, the group has since gathered a vast arsenal of precision-guided munitions thanks to friends in Tehran. Some of Hezbollah's new missiles are capable of hitting as close as 10 meters of their designated targets, and the bulk of these weapons are placed in concealed sites among the orange and banana plantations that are spread across southern Lebanon. So, to neutralize Hezbollah's threat of rockets and missiles, the Israelis would need to deploy into Lebanon and occupy the area. However, doing so would be tricky, even with the air superiority brought about by the Americans. Lebanon has mountainous terrain perfect for ambushes and attrition warfare. What's more, Hezbollah has long-range anti-ship missiles that could target the US aircraft carrier strike group in the vicinity. Whether these attacks could actually succeed is another story, but the point is that Hezbollah did not have such capabilities in the last war. It would, therefore, be a mistake to measure Hezbollah by its 2006 settings. Times have changed and the group has gotten more robust and more capable. The Hezbollah of today will not necessarily confine itself to a defensive strategy. It could flip the script and take on a proactive battle plan. By use of range, terrain, experience and sheer number, Hezbollah could launch a decoy swarm attack using inaccurate rockets and then follow through using its precision-guided missiles to strike at Israeli bases and critical infrastructure, including the three alleged nuclear assembly facilities in northern Israel. Yeah, blowing up nuclear facilities, that's the level of destruction we're at. And the thing is, it is easier for Hezbollah to strike an Israeli nuclear facility than it is for the Israelis and Americans to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. So, conflict with Hezbollah could quickly become a nasty fight where we could see tower for tower carnage. No wonder part of Iran's strategy has been to use Hezbollah to keep Israel permanently on edge. However, if Hezbollah and Iran have such an advantage, then why haven't they already unleashed hell? What's stopping full-out armed conflict? Well, for one, Hezbollah has some trouble at home. Lebanon as a state is barely hanging on. The country is in the midst of an economic crisis. Its currency has lost nearly 100% of its value in recent years. This hasn't affected the finances of Hezbollah though, its fighters are paid in dollars. However, the economic crisis in Lebanon affects Hezbollah's decision-making since it is legally part of the Lebanese government and has been since 2005. Conflict with Israel would throw Lebanon into an economic meltdown and likely affect Hezbollah's political standing for the worse. Even a rogue organization such as Hezbollah needs some public support to hold on to its parliamentary seats. Ultimately, though, whether Hezbollah gets involved or not depends on its patron, Iran. 
Since taking over the presidency in 2021, Ibrahim Raisi has taken an increasingly hard line in foreign policy. His cabinet is filled with former generals, people who know only the hammer as a tool and see everything as a nail. Iran has since taken a belligerent stance against Afghanistan, Turkey, Azerbaijan, the United Arab Emirates, and yes, Israel. However, Raisi's political turn to the right has certain restrictions. Employing Hezbollah's vast rocket and missile arsenal would mean exhausting it as leverage for years to come. At present, one of the most compelling strategic reasons dissuading Israel or the United States from launching an assault on Iran's nuclear facilities is the firepower of Hezbollah. Employing that firepower in the current Gaza conflict would mean depleting it as a means of deterrence, thereby neutralizing its role as a deterrent. Doing so would then leave Iran open and exposed to devastating aerial bombardment by the Americans. So while the Iranians are talking tough, strategically they may want to preserve Hezbollah's rocket arsenal in order to save themselves from destruction. That's something to think about. Given this, the handful of missiles that Hezbollah has fired at northern Israel to date can be seen as a means to complicate Israeli operations by raising the specter of a northern front without actually opening one. Conflict in Gaza could still trigger a regional war, but Hezbollah and Iranian officials know that Israel can hammer them even if wounded or distracted. Israel has Hamas in the crosshairs and it is not open to negotiation. Iran and Hezbollah can either steer clear of the line of fire or join the battle. Tehran has built up Hamas into the danger it is, but Hezbollah is the one rocking the stage and stealing the show. As a proxy, it is too important to lose. Iran cannot afford it. If push comes to shove, it is usually better to give up a pawn if it means protecting a rook. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report, so if you haven't yet subscribed, now is a good time to do so. Just remember to click the bell icon, otherwise you'll still be missing out on our latest content. Thank you for watching and Sarol.